So thank you wonderful people for coming to be with us in this discussion, conversation that we are about to have. My name is Oduor Obura, I'll be the moderator of these great writers. And as a way of introduction, because we are talking about myths and metaphors of belonging, so as they do the introduction, probably I might um, expound a riddle or a metaphor and, it, and request them to explain what part of you do people see when they encounter you for the first time and does that influence your writing or something like that? I think we can begin from... Um, <laughs> Is, is this working? Yes, I think it's on now. Thank you. Um, so what do people see? They see, they think I'm younger than I am. Uh, they can quite easily tell that I'm Somali. Um, but in other places, the fact that I'm a black woman is the thing that sticks out first. Um, in a context like this, I'm a writer, known as a writer. And does it, do any of these things affect the way that I write? I don't think so. I think, you know, we talk a lot about identity um, and I don't really know why. I feel, I feel like it's becoming more and more redundant as a way of understanding people, but both powerful, powerful and redundant <laughs> at the same time. So I feel engaged with politics um, and the inequalities of the world. Um, but, and I'm, in many ways, I'm subjected to those inequalities, in some ways not. And that does, that does I think, in, inform my work. But you, you wouldn't have to be this combination of identities to feel animated by those inequalities, I think. I guess the question there is, doesn't politics isn't politics massively influenced by identities and aren't our identities a key part of our political realities and our political choices and our political preferences? But anyway, that's maybe a conversation for another time. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously people look at me and they see a black woman. I mean, I am a lawyer. Uh, that's what I do for my day job. I've obviously written a book. Um, uh, one of the things people ask me a lot is, oh, so are you quitting your job to become a full-time writer? Uh, that's another thing that people kind of wonder when they see me. Uh, people see me with a young child, they think I'm a mother, which is true. Um, <laughs> and do any of these influence the novel I've written? Um, kind of. Uh, my novel is a lot about identity and, and belonging and home. And then they're not all the same concept, um, but they all meld into one another and they all inform one another. Um, and uh, for me, the question of, of identity has is, is, is been one that I've grappled with my whole life. Um, because of the fact that I am a, a mix of two, um, of two ethnicities and I've been raised uh, primarily in, in the West, in the UK and in the US, and um, I've always questioned where I belong. And where I belong is, 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 is a, uh, you know, where does one belong is a major theme of my novel, um, but I also think that's um, a major part of my identity crisis. Um, uh, like I said at the beginning, I think uh, identity, belonging, and home are all just intertwined concepts. Thank you. Um, she just didn't say her name, you as well. Nadifa Mohammed. Hafsa Zayan. And Naivo. There's something interesting about his name, which I think I've mentioned to him before. And as you tell us how people look at you and how this influences your identity, I would be interested to know why Naivo when there's... A, there's much more to the, to the name as part of your belonging. Uh, yes. Is Naivo? Uh, the long uh, version is Naivo Arisua. It's just like Patrick, and people call Patrick uh, Pat. So it's just a, a, a short 
Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. He's got a quiet voice. Unlike us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so I say the. Um, Naivo from Madagascar. I'm, um, I'm a writer. I'm a Malagasy. I, uh, I live in Canada. Uh, I'm a father, three kids, uh, and also a husband. Um, and uh, does that influence uh, what I'm writing? Am I in the texts that I produce? I think so. I think so because uh, uh, my choice as a novelist was uh, is a historical novel so far. So uh, we're talking in this festival about memories. Um, I think uh, when I started writing historical novels, my first targets were my own children to help them maybe know a little better about their culture, about their history. So yes, I'm very much in these uh, in these uh, in these writings, uh, and um, as a Malagasy as well, uh, there is uh, many things in my writings that are Malagasy. Uh, let's just for example the the novel that uh, that uh, we talk about here, historical novel, um, is framed as a traditional Malagasy poetry called Hainting. So when you read something that looks like poetry in it, it's something a little bit traditional. So yeah, so these are the ways that uh, I am in, this, uh, in, in the books I'm writing. Thank you. Um, you speak about uh, memory, and this is something that I wish to take up later on in the course of the conversation. But I want to go to some interesting tension that you're speaking about when you mention identity being both powerful and redundant. I think that's a very powerful way of thinking about belonging. And I, I would, I, I'm interested to know more about these, you know, that kind of dichotomy when, when you have something that is both redundant and powerful. And, and you know, this is something that informs when the muses, you know, for example, allow you to, to write and you want to refer to identity, what kind of restrictions come into mind? What kind of openings do these bring to you? I, I would be really interested for you to say more, and probably all of you on this. Which things in particular? Yeah, the powerful part of identity and the redundant, pa mm -hmm. redundant part okay. of identity, and how these, you know, informs your writing. Okay, Please thank you. More for the question. Um, so maybe it's to do with the character of my last novel, Mahmoud Matan, who is always described in you know, his ethnic terms, he was a Somali sailor. And when I was imagining him and researching him, it started to feel as if to me, his identity wasn't as easily fixed as that. He was someone who left Somalia, Somaliland, British Somaliland as it was then, at a very young age, in his early teens traveled throughout Africa, joined the British Merchant Navy, saw the world, ended up in Wales, and his Welsh wife said that he felt very British and wanted to fit in, um, and was constantly looking at the way that things were done in Britain. So I got the feeling of a man who wasn't as invested in these um, identities as I would have expected. So he was Somali, but lived outside of the Somali community with uh, black men from other parts of the world. He was a Muslim, nominally, but had been kind of exiled from the Muslim community for, for apparently stealing from the mosque. Um, he was an African, but in that kind of context, there was a lot of divisions between different African groups. So uh, he, I think he was aiming for this individuality that a world in the 1950s, the world in the 1950s was not ready for. He was very much a colonial subject, a black man in, in a white country. So that's where the tension, I think, was really clear to me. The way that he saw himself and these identities that much later in prison he starts to think, God, I, I thought these identities were redundant, but they were all I was ever going to be. I was going to be this sub-clan, this major clan, this Somali, this African. Um, and I could never outrun them. Um, and one of the things, the reasons that he is c accused of a crime he didn't commit is he's a convenient black threat uh, for the police to pin this crime on. 
So in, this, in, the, in the political, socio-political context, it's it, very important. But in terms of the way that we define ourselves, you know, in our internal lives and in our spiritual lives, is it very important? No. And to get to, get to understand a character like Mahmoud Matan, I had to stop thinking about him as a typical Somali, whatever that might be. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, from my perspective, um, there are communities within England that I would like to belong to or feel like I'm a part of. Um, and I don't think that I'm able to do so successfully without identifying myself as partly Nigerian, partly black, partly South Asian, partly female, partly Muslim, whatever. <laughs> you know, a fully female. <laughs> as, in, as, as in part of my identity is being female. <laughs> Um, and, and so, you know, to, to, to belong to any of these communities or any of these groups, um, I have to identify as, as, as one of them. And I think that's the thing that I have kind of always struggled with my whole life, except from the female bit, okay? Um, but, but, but yeah, so, so for me, um, I, think, I think that, that it, it's not so easy to dissociate um, and, and say that, well, you know, this part of where I've come from or this part of how I am physically or how I look um, can be sort of severed um, and I can be sort of like an international child of the world, which I am in some senses because I am so mixed and because I've traveled so much and because I've lived in so many different countries, I do feel in, in, in a part like I belong nowhere or I belong everywhere. Um, and, 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 that, and that's kind of always been how it is. But, you know, that, that's how it is. I belong nowhere and I belong everywhere. So, um, so I, I think for me, like, I, 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 can't, I can't remove the fact that I have these identities, even, even f in my personal, you know, from my own personal and spiritual standpoint, um, I, I, have to, I have to associate myself with one or the other or multiple of them. Yeah. Yes, I, I think I, I can say that uh, identity tension um, is not really uh, in my writings. Uh, it's not really in the characters for just a simple reason. I'm writing uh, about the pre-colonial period, so people had very uh, little interaction with, uh, with uh, the European cu uh, culture uh, or other cultures. Um, identity uh, with regards to myself, yes, it has uh, some importance. As a Malagasy expatriate, I live in Canada. I am a Malagasy, and I do believe that I, uh, I am uh, as Malagasy as any other Malagasy. Uh, I chose to live abroad, and I chose uh, Canada, which is a beautiful country, and uh, it's a multicultural country where you feel safe and where you uh, are with other communities, other very rich communities, very rich cultures. And I think that uh, the Malagasy community in Canada uh, is really um, uh, growing, is a dynamic com community culturally. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a Malagasy uh, deeply, and I will always be Malagasy. I live abroad, um, I live in the Western society, and, but there's no real tension, uh, at least for me, uh, in that. Um, I think I'm picking up something, and I, probably this is also related to my reading of your texts. For example, there are so many journeys, you know, um, Soti, if I pronounce the name correctly, C C uh, the, the, what, the lead character in Beyond the Rice Fields, Sito. Sito. Yes, that <laughs> I mean, he makes a lot of journeys within, within the novel from his origin, home origin, you know, to where he lives, back to the city. And then I think to move back to your first novel, Jama does a lot of journeys as well, you know, all over. And then I think also Sami, and of course, he also referred to the expulsion of Asians, for example, from from Uganda, and I don't know, maybe I could be overreading this, you know, they, they say that once a child has been, has, has been um, born, you let the child live its own life, right? You don't impose certain characteristics or features on the child, 
maybe I, I was kind of imposing a certain reading of search for belonging in these um, journeys that many of these characters take in, in your novel. Could that be the case? And I'd be interested to know what you think about this. Well, it was interesting. You said um, a child of the world. My father always liked to call himself a global citizen. And it was very true for him. You know, he, he was born into a nomadic Somali family, but left at a very young age, and then lived in Aden, in Eritrea, in Sudan, Palestine, um, Egypt, Britain, and then traveled, traveled, traveled um, to around 100 countries in the world. So he wasn't fixed. His accent wasn't fixed. His, his beliefs, his ideas weren't fixed. Um, so, somehow, um, I feel like that's, that's the roots of my family. We are, we are people who move. That's probably a closer thing for me to connect to than saying I'm from Hargeisa, where I was born in Somaliland, which has only existed as a, as a town, as a city for about a hundred and something years. The, the older history is of constant movement, of looking at the horizon and seeing what's there for you. So yes, I think I'm, I'm interested in wanderers, people who don't fit easily in anywhere, um, who aren't satisfied maybe being a solid member of just one community and who are trying to form their own identity um, beyond um, a very narrow prescription. Yeah, I love that. That's really, um, that's really beautiful. Um, yeah, I think definitely you're right that my character goes on a journey of self-discovery, as cliched as it sounds. Um, but it, it was written partly to reflect my own journey um, and, and my own sort of self-discovery of who I am and where I belong. Um, and I think, I think it's very common for a lot of second generation immigrant children, those living you know, in, in kind of modern day Britain whose families were born elsewhere, migrated over, um, either for really traumatic reasons like the South Asian expulsion, the, the focus of my novel, or just for, you know, for more opportunities like my own family. Um, but I, I, I do think that the second generation immigrant children who, who are brought up in, in the West, and they have this disconnect with the generation that preceded them, and they don't really understand um, what their parents went through, and they, they don't connect. And, and you know, the struggles that they face are so different to the struggles that their um, that their parents' generation faced. And you know, of course, it's all relative, and it's not to say that they're, they're, they're um, you know that, that that one is worse than the other. Everything is relative, but um, that process of of learning about your history um, and coming to terms with where you come from and why your parents cook that way and smell that way and eat those things and speak that language and make you pray five times a day and all of this kind of stuff. Um, you know, it's something that I found most second generation um, immigrant children go through um, in, their, in their kind of like lives like growing up. And, and so it's something that I've been through and it's something that Samir obviously does in, in, in the novel as well. So I think that's where the, the, the sort of idea of the journey and the idea of self evolution kind of came about with my novel. Yes, uh, you're right, uh, Audior. Yeah, um, my main characters are uh, are also um, uh, going to to a journey. For uh, the the main character is a slave uh, who is trying to uh, climb up the social ladder uh, using his craftsmanship. And uh, that was really uh, empowered. Um, that uh, really allowed uh, people to to be empowered craftsmanship at, in the early 19th century Madagascar, and. Um, uh, the other character, Farah, uh, she's a villager, but I would say she's a dreamer. So their journey is really a journey the, uh, to uh, a better world, uh, an imagined better world, maybe, but it's a journey to a kind of liberty. It's a journey to liberty, uh, really. Uh, I would say, like uh, Hafsa, that uh, uh, this journey uh, reflects my own uh, search, uh, not for belonging, but search for the roots of belonging, maybe. Yes, uh, I think, yeah, that's uh, a real uh, uh, sense of the, of the story. Um, and I'm just wondering, the search for roots of belonging, or even the search for belonging, is it ever, you know, achieved? In other words, is belonging a stable category? Is it something that someone can finally say that, yes, um, you know, <laughs> I found my roots. I remember there's a story I had of some 
um, Jamaican who was looking for his roots and somehow decided to, you know, the roots journey to settle back in Kenya. And then at some point realized again there's a certain cultural disconnect having lived in diaspora in Jamaica and now he's in Kenya at the coast. So is this journey ever, you know, attainable or do we just live without resolving these tensions? I mean, we, it depends we who you are. It really does depend on if you feel like as if those roots have been cut, then there is something very important and solid about seeking them out. So people whose families were forcibly taken, you know, uh, abused and brought, you know, all of their roots were cut off being taken across that Atlantic Ocean. Um, so there, there is there's something that is unresolved. While if you grow up around people in, you know, in Kenya or in Somalia or Ethiopia that are like you, that sense of belonging is kind of automatic. It's not something you search for. Maybe there are other elements of your identity. If, you're, um, if you stick out in whatever way, being disabled, uh, being gay, being um, you know, neurodivergent, mentally ill, all of these things can, can get rid of that, break down that feeling of real belonging. But it's not as if everyone is starting from the same place of, of need. Um, I think we all, do, we all want to have a community. We all want to feel understood and accepted as, as we are. Um, and if you're black and you know, you're the only black child in Cornwall, just say, and there's no one who reflects anything about you, you're always visible, you're always hyper-visible, then there's a pain there that is very specific. Um, while people who have more hidden reasons to feel as if they don't belong feel that, but are maybe able to navigate it in a different way. Respond, please. Yeah, I think that this, um, this uh, sense of belonging uh, will never, cannot be uh, achieved. Uh, it's something dynamic. It's something uh, that uh, always goes on. Why? Uh, I'm not really sure, but uh, to me, like, uh, I recently heard um, a Malagasy scholar, uh, for example, a historian, just say like this plainly, I don't know what being a Malagasy is. I don't know what a Malagasy is. So this sense of belonging is um, challenged by his history itself. It's not that, uh, you know, that in the nationalist period we had this idealized uh, uh, identity, uh, the, there, there was a political agenda, etc. But now is the time that we discover that our past uh, also has very bad things. Uh, all very bad things happened uh, in our past, uh, just like slavery. We participated in slavery. We, we did uh, awful things. There were massacres. Uh, but that's part of our, of our belonging, I would say. Uh, we belong to that because we cannot escape it. And I don't think we should try to escape it. That's our memory. And it's uh, as important as the, as, the, as the positive things. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's how I see it. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, I mean, not much more to say. I, I agree with um, Nadifa that it does depend on who you are and sort of where, you, where you've kind of come from because one of the things that I never quite understood growing up which is why people were so attached to land. I could never understand why bricks and mortar and the place where they lived was such an important thing to them, but I hadn't had that experience of being forcibly ejected or expelled from somewhere that my family had lived for generations and generations because, like I said earlier, I'm a child of the world. Like, I, I, hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't experienced that. And so in, in, in my novel and in my personal experience, um, the journey and, and the kind of evolution and the search for belonging for me has always been less about a place and finding a place to belong and more about finding people, people to belong with and like finding a community, which is why I mentioned community earlier. Um, and you know, for me, I, I, I feel like my search has stopped. I feel comfortable in the communities that I've created and the communities that I now am a part of. And they, they include things like my family and my friends and you know, they're not necessarily like larger social communities, but um, 
the ones that I have, have found and that I have made um, have helped me stop my search for continuing on. Like, just by way of example, one of my closest community of friends is a, a kind of diverse background of South Asian ladies. Um, and, you know, I'm fully South Asian to them. And they often say that I'm the most South Asian of them, even though they're ethnically all 100% South Asian. Um, you know, some of them don't even speak the language. Some of them don't eat the food or whatever it is. Like I'm talking about small cultural things. But, um, you know, for me in that group, I feel completely at ease as a South Asian woman. Um, but, you know, so it's, that's just a, one example of a community that I found that I feel like I fully belong in. Um, and, and for me, that, that, that has just stopped my search. Like, I don't need to search anymore. But people are obviously continually searching, and some people don't achieve that. And for some people, it is about a place, and it is about bricks and mortar, and it is about land and about home. For me, it's never, it's never been that way. Um, th that's interesting. Oh, do you want to? Yes. Uh, Sorry, I just wanted to, yeah. The, uh, the link to, to, to land, I think uh, in the Malagasy case, it's, it's quite easy, I would say, because uh, the, uh, the, the Malagasy, they have this powerful notion of uh, Tan Jazan, which means literally the land of the ancestors. So uh, you belong to a land for a particular reason, not because we are born there, but because you will be buried there. I think uh, it's the same for many African countries. You, you will be buried, buried there when you die. So I would say, um, for example, slavery was uh, particularly painful for Malagasy because they would die in places that were not the land of their ancestors. So I would just have uh, this. Uh, uh, now with regards to communities, um, I would say that yes, there is uh, Malagasy communities and there is uh, many things in common uh, between Malagasy, uh, cultures, uh, rituals, traditions, uh, memories, this kind of stuff. But I think personally, as a novelist, uh, especially as a novelist who writes about history, that there's a community between the people now and the people in the past. So if you talk about uh, this notion of imagined communities, it wouldn't be this imagined communities uh, as they describe it uh, uh, in uh, scholarly circles uh, as uh, a, a synchronic uh, connection, but it's more for me of a diachronic connection. I feel connected to the people of the past and uh, this is the community to me. This is the community of the ancestors. And I will be the ancestor of someone else uh, later. And that's why I'm writing, uh, actually. I'm trying to imagine the people of the past and how they ancestors imagined us. So I'm trying to imagine them, imagine them imagine, imagining us. This <laughs> is kind of complicated. But in a sense, you can, you can see it as a dialogue a dialogue between generations. And I think fiction allows to do that really beautifully. Do you imagine the future generations? Or do you only really think about the past generations, though? I never really think too much about the future generations aside from in the broader context of global social change and climate change and things like that. I don't think specifically about what these people are going to look like or what they're going to think of us other than the context in which I just mentioned. Do you tend to think and to project into the future like that? Yes, I do. I try to imagine what will be uh, Malagasy, uh, Africans in the future. And I, uh, I just uh, wa uh, watched the, the, this beautiful movie by the uh, Kenyan director. Uh, I think there's a really um, flavor of Africa in this projection in the future. And I think that, that was powerful, and I think we, we must do that. Uh, in in, Madaga in the Ma Malagasy culture, there is this notion of dindu, D-I-N-D-O. It's like uh, to leave a dindu is to leave a trace of yourself. Not necessarily like uh, being famous and being in history books and this kind of stuff. Just something that allows the new generations to remember you. So a dindu might, might be something just as like, uh, I mean, a tree in the garden that you have planted or something like that. So leaving a dindu 
is a way to connect to future generations. And I, I, I firmly believe in it. That's an interesting point you are raising, which I want to, I would like to try with your point that um, belonging, you know, is a concept which can be assembled around different, you know, ideas and notions. For example, it can be reimagined using land, um, like you're saying, using the past, or using uh, Dindu, what you, what you call Dindu. And I'm wondering, because you're saying that at some point you feel comfortable that there's no longer any quest for identity. And I'm taken back to some of the um, opening speeches, I think from Yvonne War about humanity of the other, that when we are comfortable in certain identity spaces, how do we use these um, identity spaces? How can they be used against us even though we are not um, part of the other identity? How do we um, confront these identities, especially when we become attached to them almost to sort of a nationalist um, level of attachment to our own identity? How do you, you know, experience this in your diasporic spaces and in your fictio fictitious <laughs> lives that you create? How do you respond to this when someone is too comfortable within a certain identity to the extent of um, violating other senses of identities. The question is, how do you deal with a kind of hyper-attachment to a national identity, ethnic yeah. identity? Yeah, yeah, you know, like a nationalist identity. Yeah, yeah. So I don't find, I find that kind of attachment strange. And it's very current, you know, there's all sorts of nationalisms at work in the world at the moment where people have to portray themselves as very unique, very particular, you know, we believe this, we do this. Um, if you fall short of that, you don't belong with us anymore. In Europe, it's this question of, can you be, um, you know, not white and be German or be British or be Norwegian? Um, and that there is a real tension between people who think you can be and people who really genuinely cannot let go of this idealized sense of a pure identity. Um, can you be Muslim and Indian? Can you uh, be Somali and Christian? You know, all of these things are seen as being a package deal. You can, you, you can only be this in one way. Um, and I feel, I feel like it's probably coming from something else you know, a, a sense of chaos or a fear of insecurity, um, a fear of your own social standing disappearing. And that's what makes people cling to these very narrow ideas of who, how to be and who to be. Um, for some reason, I, I've always felt a bit suspicious of fitting too neatly into any group. I prefer to challenge that group, whether that's the British, whether that's the Somalis. I feel like that's a, probably a more truthful, um, way of living, um, rather than constantly feeling this pressure to, to assimilate. Yeah, I can definitely work from that. Um, <laughs> I, it's interesting, I guess there's two aspects. There's the clinging to your sense of, you know, your sort of like very nationalistic sense of identity as an immigrant. So for example, I remember growing up, my dad would always say things to me like, oh, Nigerians don't do this. Dad, can I go cinema? No, Nigerians don't go cinema. I'm like, do they not? We don't have the cinema in Nigeria. <laughs> I'm like, but Baba, please. Um, so uh, there was that one sense of, of my family trying incredibly hard to stick to what they thought were these, um, you know, Nigerian, probably like Muslim values. Um, and, and, you know, that I've seen replicated in other immigrant communities in, in the UK. So you see sometimes how staunchly they, you know, refuse to sort of deviate from, from what's considered to be like typically the norms within that. And with they that. overcompensate 
state. They do it more than the... Than the actual, you know, you see my actual Pakistani cousins who don't behave this way, exactly. And it, when you go back to the, you know, and my Nigerian cousins as well, it's exactly the same story. So there's, there's kind of that side of the debate. Then there's the side that you were talking about. Um, and, and that, I think, is born of, of, of you know, mass immigration and, 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 and the fact that we're all moving and, 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 and Europe in particular is, 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 is receiving so many people from across the world. Um, and, and there is this sense of we need to, we need to band together and stick together. And I mean, that's obviously something that I explore a lot in the, in the book because, um, of course, when the South Asians were expelled from Uganda, Britain already had quite a large East African South Asian population. And that's why they didn't want any more to come. They were like, we've had enough. And of course, it's a job competition and all of the social consequences and um, housing issues. And it, it goes on and on. The list goes on and on. But it fostered so much anger and resentment and, and made the, you know, them versus us. Um, and, and that's something that is unfortunately being revived in the current climate. Uh, just when you kind of think you're getting over that and, and you're, you're seeing kind of like, you know, I guess this is in the States, but you're seeing like a black president and you're seeing this kind of thing. But you actually, we're not. We're not really... We're not getting over it. We're, we're kind of um, it's coming and going in waves. After after seeing one great president, you see a, a terrible one, and and it, it's it, it's it's revived and it's reviving and it's something that we can't ignore and it's something that we can't pretend isn't still happening and still continuing to happen. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's um it's it's a it's a problem this this whole like nationalism thing. But don't know how you deal with it. <laughs> Naivo, do you? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I think that uh, I, I do agree absolutely that uh, um, nationalism is something really, that there's something per pernicious that's very dangerous in it. Uh, and I would be very sad that my novel would be interpreted in, in nationalist ways. Uh, in the case of Madagascar, I could give uh, two examples uh, why nationalism is dangerous. For example, uh, many communities, I just see the gentleman who talked to me yesterday here, like the Indian communities, it's very hard to get uh, Malagasy citizenship. And even for communities, for people who are there for centuries, there are some of them who do not have uh, the Malagasy citizenship. So this is, has to do with nationalism. We have Chinese communities, we have Indian communities, but they do not have Malagasy citizenship. I talked to a friend uh, of Chinese descent, uh, Malagasy of Chinese descent, and he was saying to me, okay, my dad is from Hong Kong, but I was raised in Madagascar, but now I don't even have a Malagasy passport, so what am I? I don't belong to Hong Kong, I just belong to this country, but I don't have the citizenship. I'm not considered a Malagasy. I think that's a big problem. And that makes me very, very, very um, uh, defiant uh, towards uh, nationalism. The second example is the language. Uh, nationalists have their own agenda and often they have a misperception of the past. Uh, especially the rulers sometimes when they, are when they are not just ignorant, sorry to say that, they have a, a, te a tendency to use the past for their nationalist agenda. In terms of languages, for, for example, uh, in Madagascar, we are very lucky to have one language for the whole island for that, that the, all the peoples of the island understand. So that's a big factor of unity. But what happened in the 1970s, there was this uh, movement of using the language as a nationalist uh, tool, and it ended up in two ways. First, they took the, they, they nationalized uh, the everything, uh, uh, took, uh, put everything in Malagasy, that is good. But they focused on the formal part of this process of making everything Malagasy, technical terms of Malagasy, uh, etc. Uh, but they focused on the, uh, the formalist uh, aspect of this. So they focused on the grammar. And when you do not write Malagasy correctly, you're not a real Malagasy. That's the absurdity of nationalism. Well, what they, they, they should have done is to promote content. We are Malagasy because of the content. Content is the past, content is the poetry, content is, they did not do that. They focused on what is 
us and what is not us. You speak correctly, you don't do grammatical mistakes, you are Malagasy. Um, <laughs> interesting ways of defining who a Malagasy is. Um, I, I wanted to move to memory, and I think I'm almost opening the floor to the audience to contribute to this conversation. Yeah, um, and I, I want to take you back to memory. You speak a lot about memory, and we learn a lot from the archives. You know, you're speaking about the British, and I, I remember I, I was reading some article that in the 60s, you know, when the empire was collapsing, the British empire was collapsing, at some point they opened their doors, you know, for all members of the former colonies to be British citizenship. And I think they realized so quickly what they had done and immediately closed that door which had been opened to all the empire. And suddenly moving back to Britain became a big issue. So we can learn a lot from history and how identity is, you know, um, constructed and how it is used in, in such purposes. So when we think about memory in terms of belonging, in terms of identity, why do we need the past? Is it, you know, because we want to think of the past as, you know, that golden moment we want to relive which might be elusive in nature? Do we use the past or memory for creating... Sorry. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Um, do we use memory to kind of fashion ways of looking at identity as, you know, something that one separates us from other people or something that also makes us think of ourselves as superior to others or something? You know, what are the uses and abuses of memory in terms of creating belonging in our fiction and in our everyday lives? I think we use a lot of history in our, yeah. almost all the notes I've written, there's an element of history. How does this feed into? I think Britain yeah. is an obvious place to think about that. You know, mm -hmm. we had uh, the loss of the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth, um, and it was very, very strange what happened afterwards. Um, I think the country is in a very unstable point, and she had been a point of stability She'd been there for 70 years. You know, everyone was, was used to her as being the head of state. Um, and as she got older, she became almost like, a, you know, this familiar kind of maternal figure, figurehead. So, you know, people were queuing in, in the middle of the night, in the day. <laughs> um, 250,000 people queued to see uh, her coffin in Westminster Hall. And it was, the BBC was full North Korea, um, talking about, you know, um, <laughs> the royal family in this, in a, in a religious way. And it tapped into something which I often, we can often ignore about Britain as a modern state. But it's created this very, very, very strong narrative based on its history uh, of royalty, of conquest, of military might, um, of Christianity, Anglicanism in particular. Um, and that is the state. That is the state. The state is more complicated than that on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, the empire was forced to become multicultural in some respects. Um, but this is the essence of this state that some people will stand out in the cold for in the middle of the night. Um, and we all feel a belonging to this country in, in different ways. But, you know, the, the land of Shakespeare, of, of, um, of Wellington, of you know, the Blitz, all of these shared cultural experiences, some of them shared by people from non-British, non-English backgrounds who were living in this, you know, this, there's been a, a multicultural population for centuries in Britain, um, but often not part of the narrative, kept out of the narrative, um, but often spotted in different ways. So if you go to Trafalgar Square and there's one of the, uh, Nelson's Column, one of the figures, one of the sculptures is of a young black sailor they're there, but they're almost like ghosts. Um, and when the state is, in, is enforcing its narrative, its mythology, it's, it's, it's very different to people like us. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I was just reading um, John Wolfe and Kesha Abraham's um, book, which has just been released a couple of, 
or weeks ago called Black Victorians in Britain. And it's insane how many um, artists, uh, musicians, scholars, doctors, I mean, just, uh, and, and, and just regular people as well. I mean, they chronicle the lives of, I think it's probably about 20 different, um, you know, black Victorians. And, and, and their research goes through the archives and, and talks about how there is very little archival material on them. But they existed and they exist. And I think this, this question was, uh, this point was raised earlier about how, um, you know, the, the, the nationalist agenda is something that the state perpetuates. But actually, the people who are living in the country as well, because we don't know about the existence of um, these figures in our in our in in, in the past of, of Britain, we also perpetuate it because we agree we don't realise that these people existed and that they 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 exist. And so, uh, I mean, this is probably not really answering the question. I was just picking up on what you were saying. Um, but what was the, the question was about the past? Yeah, the question was about the past. I I I, I tend to find that I. Yeah, I focus a lot on, on, on the history and, and what happened. It is focused on the question, actually. You're right. I'm coming back to it. Um, but yeah, I do focus a lot on the, on the history and, and, and what's gone because, for me, it really informs the present. Um, um, and, and obviously, like, I haven't looked that far into the future, as I've suggested earlier. I'm too obsessed with the past. But um, one of the things that I, f I found, especially when writing We Were All Birds of Uganda, I guess there's two things I want to say. Um, the first is that I wanted to, to, to see what parallels there were between the past and the present and to see to what extent the, the second generation immigrant living in, in Britain um, with, with this, these family ties to, to Uganda, um, he kind of thinks that he's very different to his, to his grandfather. Um, in particular, culturally, socially, um, his views towards the black community. And, you know, my novel tries to draw out the similarities between them um, and, and just tries to explore a little bit about why he thinks that his grandfather was so abhorrent and his views um, towards the black community were so abhorrent, yet he at the same time does perpetuate a lot of black stereotypes, you know? And so I, I, I was trying to draw these parallels between the past and the present to, to explore why we haven't moved on so much. And, you know, has, has the dialogue and the conversation, maybe the parameters have shifted, like things have changed a little bit, but the issues at their core remain the same. Um, and then I think I said there was a second point, but I can't remember it. <laughs> and I'll quickly just drop in. I think there is a resurgence in literature that's claiming a space, a black space in Britain over the years. There's a new book coming out with a foreword by uh, Zadie Smith, but I can't remember the, the name of the book, um, which is looking at the black history um, of Britain. It's not the one by James Patterson, is it? No, it's by a woman. Oh, okay. It's a reissue from a book, I think, from the 70s. Um, and it, it, it feels, to, I find it kind of insulting um, when we're always having to say, but we were here, mm. we were here, we were fighting in the Second World War, we were in the Blitz, mm. um, we were in the First World War, um, we were at Waterloo, you know, the black figures throughout history and Asian figures. Um, and this country only got as wealthy as it did by exploiting all of these people. Um, so this, it's like, okay, yeah, we were here, but we were often here as... as as, as oppressed people. Mm. Um, and maybe that black Victorian um, who's you know, studying law in, in London in the 1850s, maybe he has descendants now who don't look black at all, who mm. don't know that they're black at all, and think of Britain as this very uh, white, English, uh, English-controlled, led um, space. So the past and the future are in conversation and often speaking, I think, over each other, around each other, not, not directly to each other. Okay, um, speaking, speaking of, do you want to say something? Yes. Yeah, <coughs> I, yeah I think I, 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 I totally agree. I have nothing uh, uh, major to add to that. Just a particular point that you, uh, your question, uh, Odor, uh, why do we have to, to, to look at the past to define ourselves, I think? The, the easy answer is because we have been uh, subject to a trauma and uh, this had repercussions on us to this day. In the case of Madagascar, it's uh, the trauma of, uh, uh, the, I would say, the, 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 the religious trauma and, the, and then the colonial trauma. Uh, so, no, I just wanted to, to, to say that. You are speaking of spaces being reclaimed. I think it's time the audience reclaimed their space <laughs> in this conversation. Uh, so um, I think it's... Yes. Thank you. We can give her the mic, please. 
Good afternoon. My name is Rata Upadhyay. I'm an economist. I'm uh, based at the University of Nairobi. Thank you for a very interesting conversation. Um, uh, I also often struggle with identity issues, and I think I like to define myself as an Asian African. But I'm struggling at the moment with these, what you talked about, these rise of different nationalisms. Like growing up, I was really proud of being a Hindu as a, you know, um, like, and I kind of thought of it as a very tolerant faith. But the last 15 years, particularly this year, the rise of the Hindu right kind of almost makes me feel like I don't belong. Um, and I know you said that you don't have the answers, but like, can we think like, I'm honestly, I, I honestly can't see like, and everyone's like, don't stress, it's happening all over the world. Look at Spain, look at Italy, look at Brazil. But that doesn't make me feel better. And I don't see, I don't see any like lights to then um, reduce that. And I'm almost surprised, like I agree Nadifa where you said that, you know, the, the identity can be both very powerful but very redundant. But I'm surprised how many people are kind of almost following the politicians, whether it's in Kenya or in India or uh, of like the more narrow identity and they almost like that more. Um, so if there are any like lights or <laughs> things that we can contribute to to make this sort of um, nationalisms less um, problematic. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to grab that? Yeah. Are we doing it one by one? one uh, okay. I think, when I think about those nationalists, you know, there's Trump in the US, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in, in India, and they get along really well. <laughs> so it's not about the nationalism so much. It's not, they don't actually love America or Brazil or India. It's something else. It's, it's an attitude. It's a way of looking at the world. Um, a hyper macho, capitalist, hostile, um, violent ethos. And there are many people in, in every country that don't ascribe to that who may be happy being British, Somali, whatever they are, but don't feel this attraction to, to imposing themselves on other people, of dominating, of, of appropriating um, their wealth. So across countries, across India and Pakistan, there are lots of people who agree with each other. Um, Britain is isolating itself in lots, of, in lots of ways, but there are many, many people in the country who do not go along with that little England Brexit, um, racist attitude um, that seems to have taken hold quite suddenly, but it's never sudden. It's, I think, this, this wave that comes and goes, and it was present before, um, you know, when the South Asian, um, South African South Asians arrived, there was a, a steep rise in racist rhetoric, and you had Enoch Powell with his speech about rivers of blood coming mm -hmm. from this this invasion of black and brown people into Britain. And then it seemed to go away again, and, and now it's coming back. So that does give me hope. You know, they are very vocal, they're very aggressive, they, they, they sow division between people. But it's a, it's a very specific and kind of perverse way of looking at the world that they all maintain. I think just to add to that as well, um, you know, because uh, social media has its obvious <laughs> negatives, but one of the massive upsides of it is that you you can you can be part of communities where um, there are there are narratives that counter what we're seeing, you know, in in the media about Putin's and and, and Trumps and the like, you know. So I've felt comforted sometimes being in those spaces where I recognize that even though these horrible things are happening in the world and it seems like the whole world suddenly has a really strong nationalist agenda, actually there are these, there are these voices um, that are taking up a lot of space. I know it's on the internet, but it's still a community that you can feel a part of and you can feel some comfort from the fact that these, these people, you know, they're, they're shared kind of understanding with you and, and, and you kind of feel, um, I don't know if that's some kind of light. Um, I think there's another question over okay. there. It's a yes. little bit dark in that corner. Okay, good evening. My name is Caroline. I'm so happy to be here. Um, okay, uh, my question was about translation. Has any of your books been translated maybe in your native languages like Somali, maybe Malake, uh, Swahili? And uh, what do you feel about uh, maybe translating the books more in African languages? 
you think that would be more, uh, you know, would be more key in sort of <coughs> archiving our memories more, especially because uh, it's our African writers who are writing? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a very important question. Uh, I think translation is really important for us, uh, for us Africans. Uh, I would love uh, that my novel uh, yeah, be translated in, in Kiswahili, for example. And I'm looking forward for the, to to uh, African <coughs> books, other African books, translated in Malagasy. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen, and uh, there's an effort to to, to be done here. Uh, as I said. Uh, yesterday, I think. I only discovered uh, things fall apart uh, when I was in university. That I would, love, uh, I would have loved to, to read it in Malagasy when I was in high school, for example. But uh, we only had, uh, the translation that we had was, uh, I don't know, Molière, uh, this kind of stuff. Some uh, Mal Mal Malagasy poets translated uh, French uh, poets and, or French uh, um, uh, playwrights. Uh, yeah, I think it's very important that uh, Maybe this kind of initiative like uh, Macondo could lead to that, why not? Uh, because translation is not only something like uh, you push a button and you, and you change languages, it's not that, it's a creative process. And I think that we should uh, promote uh, this activity within, uh, in connection with the literary activity and that we should read each other. Thank you. My novels should be coming out in Somali. Um, they're in the process of being translated. Um, it, was, it was meant to happen earlier and it didn't, but inshallah it will happen from now on. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm very, very happy for that to be the case. And I would love my novels to be translated into Swahili, Amharic, Tigrinya. You know, my father's journey covered 10 or eight different African states. Um, and in a way it feels like it's not just a Somali story, but it also belongs to all of these place, places that he passed through, who he fought in, and he, in Eritrea he was taken in by a, a, an ethnic group, the Konama, who were matriarchal and they gave him land, so it feels as if I, I would like to, to read that story, tell that story in, that, in their own language, as a way of saying thank you, as a way of fostering these bonds that seem to appear and then are not fostered for very long. Yeah, um, just to clear up a misconception, authors don't have that much control over which um, languages their novels are translated into, and I say that much, I mean they have no control. Um, it kind of gets handed over to the publisher and the agent and whoever's um, negotiating your translation rights, so it's not as if um, we decide, oh, I want my novel translated into Swahili, this language, this language, and, and then sent across all the world. So yeah, so the, I'm caveating my answer because my, my novel hasn't been translated into any other languages yet. So that's, that's why I prefaced it. I didn't choose that. I wish it had been. <laughs> and maybe it still will be. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Some novels don't get translated for like 10 years. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, tr translation is not, is not only about uh, being read uh, by other people in other uh, countries and in other cultures. Uh, translation is also about empowering the native languages because this is very important. Uh, when a child at school can read, uh, I don't know, uh, rivers of blood uh, in their native languages, for example, that is very, very important for the African creativity, for our creativity. So I just wanted to mention that. All right, <laughs> wonderful people. Uh, I'll not say ladies and gentlemen, because I don't want to be canceled. So we've come to the end. So thank you very much for being part of this conversation. Can we give please a round of applause for this one?